Ladies and gentlemen, so I don't think that many of you know what Glasgow 3 means, uh, and ignorance is bliss, because Glasgow is a coma scale. So it is used for traumatic brain injury patients, and I'll tell you quickly how it works. It's actually very ingenious and very simple. So you have a quote from 5 to 1 for speech, from 5 to 1 for eyes, and from 5 to 1 for movement. You cannot have zero. So one is no eyes open, one is no movement, one is, uh, and, and the last one is no speech. Glasgow 3 is electrical death. So in 2006, I uh, got confronted with, uh, my son was brought in at, with Glasgow 3, and I spent three months in ICU, and a lot of hospitals later was, uh, together with my wife. And during these nights of uh, powerlessness and uh, frustration, uh, I had been running laps for a bigger part of my life, I decided to, that it was high time to make the tricorder. That mythical device out of Star Trek that gives power to the consumer of healthcare. And I started to look at my environment. Oop. Environment doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, first of all, the doctor's office, because I needed tools. I needed to, to have access to these tools. I needed to shrink them. I needed information, and I needed knowledge, so, because I didn't have skills as a physician. So I, I started with hiring what I thought like one of the best teams in the world, and we started using uh, all of these uh, process flows of, of medicine, like the doctor's office. So what's in there? All these, all these tools. So, from a doctor's office, you mostly go to an ER. More tools. Actually, it's the same tools plus three more tools, but it's completely integrated in a computer system. Then from an ER, they send you to radiology. A lot of imaging. Uh, so, and from radiology, they also put you into labs. So, with your blood tests, your saliva, your cultures. And all this they bring together, and if, if it worsens out, ICU, which is continuous monitoring. All these tools I needed. So I started in Palo Alto, in IDO, with, uh, so my team, we cohabited with IDO to find a way, a roadmap, to build this tricorder the size of an iPhone. And so that everyone in the world would have all these tools, all the knowledge, and all the machine learning and pattern recognition that the doctor has. And uh, it was actually uh, a very interesting time to look for this American medical consumer that didn't exist. So, and this is what we came up for. Technology has given us an unprecedented window into the human body. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we're still in the dark about our own health. We are changing that. What if instead of fearing the worst when you notice something out of the ordinary, you could identify the condition yourself? Getting the right diagnosis would save you worry. It says it's roseola. And an unnecessary doctor's visit. Rest at home, it's okay. Instead of hearing about a viral outbreak on the news, imagine you got an alert that was tailored to your family's needs. It would also give you advice about what to do next. What if you had a way to identify what was wrong right away? It says it's 103.8. A way to get all of the information you need to understand the situation. And in serious cases, you would know when and where to seek help. It recommends taking it to the urgent care. We're building a way for people to check their bodies as often as they check their email. It's all possible, and it's only the beginning. So this was our roadmap going to be, and our first market to reduce parental anxiety for parents with kids. Um, so. Uh, what are we going to put in the tricorder? The prototype will be ready in September, uh, by the way. A whole sorts of uh, esoteric sensors, but 
Um, if you ask me what the future is, it's not plastics, it's not electronics. The future is light. It's optics, advanced optics. So the combination of all these tools in sensors and the shrinking of all these sensors, plus machine learning, plus pattern recognition, uh, should give us a total hospital experience. And we were confronted with several questions while we were doing this. Like, should we replace doctors with machines? So my immediate reaction is, well, if a doctor can be replaced by a machine, uh, well, he should, or he should, because it's nothing personal, but there is a big, pri a big, a big need of, of, of private care, and there's a big need of accessibility, and uh, nobody is satisfied with the healthcare system. It breaks down all over the world. Even physicians are not satisfied with it. So, as... The baby boom generation has, ex ex uh, you know, has been very, very good at decentralization, disintermediation, and de-skilling. This will also happen here. It's just a question of time. What is then the, the mission of a carbon-based unit of a human being? Well, we will gladly go to machines for our healthcare, who are actually a lot better in uh, collecting comprehensively data. But in the end, we will want to talk to a human being for empathy. We want empathy. Uh, it's something we cannot build in machines. So if we free up the doctor from all the, collect the collection of data, because we made them an accountant now, so, and we, if we have our own records and our own metrics, and he can do the emphatic relation, I think this is a success story. Um, we will also have to rethink artificial intelligence. So we have started artificial, you know, when 30 years ago, we had high hopes for artificial intelligence, but it, somehow it got stuck. And understandably, because in the beginning, everything, you know, people like learning new stuff, but at 70% of the target, it's a lot easier because it gets harder. It's a lot easier to start something new. We have to we have, again, to reconsider artificial intelligence, and certainly for diagnostics, um, because this is one of the questions that Watson, the IBM computer, could not answer. Who won the French Revolution? He's looking for a person. Everything that, so you see there on the, on, on the, the left is my favorite robot. It's uh, Summer Glau in uh, uh, Sarah Connor's Chronicles. This is everything we now wear on our body. In the future, we will probably wear in our body. Uh, so Proteus already has ingestible pills. Uh, you see there the pacemaker, the stent, the defibrillator, uh, MC10 tattoo balls. Uh, so a lot of these of sensors will not only be built into our, into our environment, but also into our body. Are we ready to do so? Well, we're doing it already. LA is the number one city in the world of implantables. <laughs> what technology will change the game? It's, it's very easy. It's CMOS. It's cheap old chips. And it's low, you know, you don't need a big battery. And it's a game changer because the camera on a chip, if you're looking about, talking about optics, if you can make a clinical machine that costs $100,000 into a $3 sensor uh, chip, that will be a game changer. Do you want to watch your devices or do you want your devices to watch over you? We ask that question over and over again in our surveys. Uh, and people actually want, they are actually so lazy that they want that their devices, devices watch them. So a good tricorder experience would be you take your cell phone while you are bringing it here you know, the camera has taken hyperspectral images of your complete body. It feels the warmth, it contacts you, it sniffs your, your, uh, your breath, and it also uh, uh, listens to the timbre of your voice. And all this, you know, it gets into a, pro a medical profile with metrics, with oximetrics and everything. So people want their devices to watch them. These, these chips, these new sensor chips can be built into anything. Also your TVs. Will we become cyber contracts? Yes. But uh, I, think it's, I tend to think it's a good thing. We're already hypochondriacs, you know, like we're just going to be more efficient uh, hypochondriacs. 
Um, also, another side effect is kenosis. It's also from LA, because people now, so it's less than $1,000 for a full body scan. You know, now, luckily, they are going for MRIs. They used to go for CTs every week to see if they don't have cancer. Well, you know, six months, you have cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Why are hospitals like banks? Well, basically because banks like hospitals, they only give numbers to people who don't need it. You know? In a bank, you give, they give numbers to the rich. They don't re in, in a hospital, you only get all your numbers in the ICU while you're dying. While you're alive, they don't give you any numbers. So it doesn't make any sense. Do you really need diagnosis? I found a diagnosis. No. You can't sleep because you're scared you might not wake up again. You know, that really doesn't help me. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps diagnosis comes from another worldview. Perhaps we don't want diagnosis. Basically, when we go to a doctor's office, we diagnose ourselves. We sit there, there is this Freudian construct looking at us, and we, we are the narrator. And we look at his body language, we're concerned, we lower around. If he's not paying attention, we say like, oh, it hurts, it hurts. And in the end, we auto-diagnose ourselves and, and pay and go home. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps we don't need diagnosis. Perhaps we need recommendation engines of actions to do. Why do you like the weatherman? <laughs> well, because you want good news. You don't want bad news. That's why people, they are so relaxed when they see the weatherman. Everything is already passed, so nothing, you know, like the weather. And he gives a prediction and everyone knows like, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the consumer, he doesn't want to know clinical accuracy of his glucose. He wants a smiley. You know, in, this is the big difference on medical consumption on the consumer side and clinical consumption. So accuracy is not, they want a weatherman. You are as healthy as a story you tell yourself. So when somebody tells you, that this is the, the main thing about these full body MRIs, you always find something. And you know, people get very worried, so they take another MRI, then they do the blood test. So they actually, down, downstream, they, they overburden the system. Who will, you know, all these brands are now looking for health data. Who will own our bathroom, you know, our living room, our bedroom, our kitchen, the car? Uh, so I've seen these, you know, I, I've put some of the brands underneath. You will quickly find out who will own what. Uh, person analytics. Uh, this is Stephen Wolfram. For 20 years, he has logged everything. So, and this made him actually, you know, more um, understand himself more. He knows that he shouldn't do emails before 7 o'clock in the morning. He should not talk after 11 o'clock at night because it says rubbish. <laughs> um, so he should, you know, do uh, uh, more exercise during the day while he's, he has a key logger, he has sensory. So wouldn't it be great if we kept all the data on ourselves? There are some statistics. I'm not going to read it to you. You're probably all aware. IBM uses this in their uh, marketing campaign for Watson. As you see, one in five diagnoses is wrong. And there's a lot of more statistics like this. So my last question is, where is our outrage? Why don't we do anything? Why are we content with such a level of ignorance? So, and, and I thought, like, as an official member of the baby boom generation, so, you know, we have, perhaps this is our last assignment to disrupt healthcare. I'm certainly going to make it my, my last assignment. And I think that we will be the last generation that know so little about our health. And if we disrupt healthcare, everything else that we've done in our generation will be a footnote to what we can do here. So we have invented the future. I think it's time to prevent it now. Thank you. <laughs>